Hello wonderful people of the internet, today I'm going to be reviewing Equal Rights by Terry Pratchett, so without any further ado, let's get into it. Okay, so Equal Rights is the third book in the Discworld series and is the first book in the series to not be, uh, to be a standalone, if that makes sense. It is the first one in the Witches Saga, but it is still a standalone book in the sense that you don't have to read any before it and there aren't really any other books that follow one directly after it. So um, that means that it is different from the first two books and is more similar to what Discworld becomes later on. But that's enough rambling about that. Let's get into Equal Rights. Is Andrew Garfield on his good side? He is. Okay, so this is going to be a spoiler review of the book. So if you haven't read Equal Rights or plan on reading it sometime soon, click off now and come back later if you want to. But if not, um, let's start talking about this book. So what is Equal Rights about? Equal Rights is a uh, Equal Rights is about a girl called Escarina Smith, who it lives in the Ram Tops, which are the mountains in um, in the um, hub of the Discworld, in a village called Badass, which is named after a donkey that wouldn't move. Um, she is the Discworld's first female wizard, in the sense that when wizards die, they give their staff of power and all their magic to the eighth son of an eighth son because the number eight is the most magical number in the disc world. And uh, a wizard called Drum Billet did this for um, Escarina, but at the time, neither her dad or the wizard who were the ones involved in it knew that Esk was a girl. And so that meant that Esk was kind of imbued with this wiz wizardly magic that she is at least not typically meant to have. And it's about what happens after that. It's about Esk, kind of whether she's going to be a witch, whether she's going to be a wizard, and why she can't be both. That's that's what the book's about. So what did I like about this book? Now, um, this is my favourite Discworld book that, um, that it, chronologically anyway, this is my favourite one written so far in the chronological reading order, because it's such a fun story. I want to say some of the things that are so fun about this story, um, and I've got loads written down on my notes over here, so you'll see my eyes going over here so I can talk about everything, because for the last few reviews I've sat down editing and then remembered something that I um, wanted to talk about and be kicking myself. I'm like, ah, you didn't talk about so-and-so. Like in the Light Fantastic review, I wanted to talk about um, the, um, the, the Red Star people, but I didn't get onto that. Um, so I'm, I've written loads down so that I can cover all, cover all bases. So, borrowing is a really fun element of the story. It's one of the main pieces of witch magic that um, is demonstrated in the book. Um, it's when you kind of hop into the passenger seat of an animal's brain and just gently steer it in uh, to do your bidding. So it's not like taking over, it's just gently influencing, which is a fun, just a fun idea in general, and it's not just animals that you can, um, like old buildings have kind of a life of their own, so you can get into their brains. It's just a fun magical thing that was introduced in this book. Um, there was a group of people called the Zoons, who were um, a bunch of people who travel by boat that are really bad at lying. In fact, they they just can't lie, and so each clan or group of Zoons has an appointed liar who will do all the trade and like communication with the outside world and this um, appointed liar is greatly respected in the community for having this refined art of being able to not tell the truth which is hilarious and I hope they turn up later um, kind of more in the series because I haven't encountered them in any of the future books that I read but I did really like them so I hope maybe in the witches books they recur if you know um, leave that in the comment uh, comics comments please because um, I'd be interested to know if they turn up again um, just looking at my notes, there was um, uh, yeah, um, there's a broomstick in the story because it's about witches. It's got to be a broomstick, but it's a broomstick that doesn't really work. It's kind of old and tattered, so to get it started, you have to kind of run and jump on it, and it doesn't fly very well. It only goes like you know, like a couple of you know, tens of feet above the ground and travels at about five miles per hour, and only at night, for, and makes the travelling sections of which there are a lot in this book because it's about. Esk and the character of Granny going from their town in Badass all the way down the mountains and then into Ankh-Morpork where Unseen University is, so there's a lot of travel and the broomstick made that quite fun. 
Oh yeah, the um, I wrote Run from the Sun, which is um, a moment in this book where Granny and um, Esk are on this broomstick, and in the disc world, light is, um, moves slowly because of the strong magical field, and so they, this broomstick only flies at night, like I said, so they're flying quite high up, and the lo and the daylight is chasing them, and they, it's, it was just a great scene because that's something that could only happen in the disc world, and I love that. That was um, definitely something that I remembered the most about this book. I did reread the start of this in preparation for this video just to get a feel for the story again, and um, going in, that was one of the main things I remembered. Um, and there was a line in that moment where I think. Uh, Esk says, I don't want to hit the ground, it never did anything to me. Uh, I thought that was quite funny. Um, what else have I got on my notes? Uh, nothing n nothing else to do with the story, so we'll move on to the next thing I really liked, and that was Granny Weatherwax, who is the kind of main character in the Witches books, or at least after this one. She certainly stole every scene she was in in this one. Now, Granny Weatherwax is um, a really interesting character, as in she's like a very traditionalist witch, who has um, a very fun outlook on life, as in for when it comes to communicating with other characters. She's like, um, she, I, re I, I carry on reading the quote like, she does fun, but she, no, she, where did that come from? She, she does right, but she doesn't do nice. That's the quote I carry on reading. Now that, that, prob so that probably crops up in one of the books later on, but that's true. Um, she always does the right thing, but she's never really nice about it. She's quite pragmatic and almost cold, but um, really warm to the uh, at times as well. It's like I, I'm very bad at summarizing characters, but I, I want to just kind of get across how great Granny Weatherwax is as a character. Um, she always wears black and her hat because she believes that that's part of the magic of being a witch. If you look like a witch and look different from everyone else, and people, you know, instantly kind of recognise you and respect you. Respect? Respect you! And so that that's like gives you a power over people that she calls, you know, magic. And that links into what she calls headology, which is basically psychology, where she'll like give people placebo brews and lotions because the te things tend to sort themselves out if people think that what they've taken will help them. And so she uses things like that to her advantage. So even though she does have magic, and it's hinted in this book that she's like incredibly p powerful as a magic wielder, she doesn't really use it much because she's got things like headology in her arsenal as well, and she actually tries not to use magic as much as she can because um, she said um, that um, if a job's worth doing, then it's worth doing badly. Like She won't use magic to light a fire, one, because that's wizard, wizard magic, but also because she can light the fire with her hands. And she said, um, if the creator had intended for us to light fire with magic, then he wouldn't have given us matches. And it's like, just things like that, um, that make me love her character. And there was an interaction that I, um, folded the page on in this book because, um, I remembered this from my first read through. And that's when Esk is thrown out of the Wizards University, kind of laughed out for wanting to be the female wizards. And, uh... And S says, and then everyone laughed at me. Someone even gave me a sweet. And then Granny goes, you got some profit out of the day then. And proceeds to kind of explain to her why it wasn't so bad that she got laughed at. Because, you know, worse things could have happened. And it's just like, how she constantly counters people getting all woeful with just like cold hard logic. The point I'm trying to, you know, get across is that she's a great character and I look forward to reading her in the future Witches books. Um, in fact... I think the next one's Weird Sisters, which comes in two books time, so I will look forward to that. Hi, this is Future Frank here. I, despite all my rigorous note taking, I did forget to mention something that I really liked about this story, so I'm just gonna slide it in here. Now, um, this is still about Granny Weatherwax. Um, at the start of the book, she's very close-minded about whether women can be wizards or whether men can be witches and all of that, she's quite fixed in her ways, and she's still really stubborn at the end, but throughout this book, you see her begin to change her views on how magic can be used, and that's really fun, you know, that's the most character growth we've had in the Discworld book so far. And also, with Granny, she has lived her whole life in the mountains, so going down into the more urbanised areas of Angkor Pork and the suburbs around it is quite challenging for her, and so you get this little subplot of her settling in to the shades of Angkor Pork and starting to set up a living there, and it's just all those things 
that make this book just so lovely and a bit better for me than the last two because you had the kind of sub the subplots that become so characteristic of the books later on. Now, while I'm here talking to you, I just want to apologise for my um, all the times that I say kind of and um in this video because I'm quite incoherent on this just because I read it a bit um, more in the past. See that I even did it that a bit more in the past than the previous books. So excuse that I'm not quite on the game or as much as I was last time. I still hope you enjoy the video though. Back to the original. Alright, so this is a future Frank to the future Frank. That's some pretty meta stuff right there. Um, I, I forgot to talk about one of the most important things in this book, and that is kind of the social commentary, of which there, it's, it's more apparent that there is a message in this book than in the previous two. I mean, even the title, Equal Rights, you know, tells you what this book's going to be about. Because um, it's about the ums and the, and the you knows are still here, but um, <laughs> the, uh, I'm losing my mind here. The... Uh, Terry Pratchett uses the fixed jobs of witches and wizards to portray um, how society has little boxes that um, they put men and women into and he counters this attitude in this book by questioning uh, all the wizards, to throw a bit of background, say that women can't be witches because it's written in the law, you know, it's written somewhere, but for the life of them, they can't figure out where it is written, and Esk constantly asks them, you know, where's it written? Where, where's it written? And Granny starts to pick that up as well, so that when it comes to the end, Esk does become a wizard, and it just shows how in society we have these just expectations that we force people to comply to, despite the fact that there's no real logic behind why that is. And this is the first sign of Terry Pratchett using the Discworld to portray and debate, um, you know, global societal issues that um, he's famous for as the series goes on. So that's really exciting as well. Okay, this time really back to the video. What else have I got down here? Um, just some more little details on the creatures of the dungeon dimensions, which um, were um, a group that, well, well, you know, um, a bunch of creatures that had been involved in the like, light fantastic, but um, in this book they're kind of the main antagonists but also the driving force of the plot and I really like that about them so the creatures in the dungeon dimensions are drawn to strong uses of magic and they want to uh, kind of use that as a doorway into our reality where they'll basically destroy everything and the thing that motivates Granny to take Esk away from Badass to the Unseen University is Esk being spotted by the creatures from the dungeon dimensions and from then on they carry on kind of following Esk and that's they, they were always kind of present and I really like that about them because in Discworld they're um uh, or at least not usually not in the first two anyway there's never really a villain that sticks around the whole time like there'll be ones that crop up but they're dealt with pretty fast um and this one they were present the whole time and I thought that was fun and they're a fun antagonistic force to have um now, I do want to talk about one more moment, which was towards the end of the book, where Granny goes into the Great Hall of the University, and the Arch arch Chancellor, who is called Cutangle, I believe, um, says, you know, oh, you can't be in here, you're a woman, fra fra fra, and um, they it ends in kind of a magical duel, um, and like, uh, Cutangle is a really powerful wizard, you know, he's, because he's the Arch Chancellor of the University, he knows his stuff, but, um, Granny it literally completely dominates him, and that was um, kind of a moment of realisation in the book because, as I said, Granny never really uses magic, but here she does it and she just obliterates this master of the art, and it's like, ah, uh, so she's really powerful. And I, uh, that was a great moment uh, just to kind of further deepen her character and show how her philosophy affects how she leads her life. Now I'm going to stop rambling about all the things I love because, as I've said before, when I talk about things I love I tend to get incoherent and go around in circles and I feel like I'm doing that so I want to move away from that as fast as possible to make this as entertaining for you as possible. So we've got Mr Garfield on the negative side. Um, I've only got two things on the, ne the negative side so this will be over pretty quick. Um, one of them was the slow plot. Now I remember on my first reading this kind of bothered me. I'm not entirely sure why. It's like, well, I, I had rather negative feelings towards this book 
after my first reading, and so that's why I wanted to dip into it again to see whether they'd stick around, but they didn't. I mean, I, I remember not liking the beginning in particular, but I was reading the beginning, and I loved the beginning, so I don't know what went on there. I think it might have been in my head I like to kind of visualise characters, or at least have an idea of how they look, maybe how they'll talk, and I was having trouble to visualise Granny, because on the cover, she kind of, she looks like that, right? And online I'd seen a picture of, well, a different picture of her, and so my brain was, like, morphing them together and it wasn't working. On my second re um, read-through that I did before this video, um, I had a really solid image of not the cover image of Granny, but the, so that's Josh Kirby's interpretation of her. And I had poor kid bees in my brain, and I prefer that look for her anyway. But I think that might have been why I didn't like it the first time. But um, yeah, the slow pace might put some people off, but I really like it because you know it's just time to explore this new side of the disc world with the ram tops and witch magic that hadn't been explored before, and I enjoy that as a part of the story. Um, the other thing was Simon. Now towards the end of the book, Simon gets kind of possessed by the creatures from the dungeon dimensions, and he's got in his hand like a he, he says a lot of things that don't make sense and I think that's intentional but equally I'm not sure if it is and so yeah again I just got a bit uh, this happens quite a lot with me I get confused quite easily especially because I read these books quite late at night usually before I go to bed which is probably a terrible idea because for someone who's as witty and clever as Pratchett I kind of need to be on my toes to appreciate everything and I'm definitely not in the best, you know, I, I probably need to start reading these during the day, but um, I don't have time because I'm I'm a busy man. But um, yeah, I got kind of confused about Simon, and I think because he carried on saying like these ambiguous things, and he had this like representation of the disc world in his hands that he said that had to be protected, which didn't make sense. It was I think he was saying he created like the scientific theory of atoms and stuff, and so that meant that there was a representation of Discworld in the immaterial world of the dungeon dimensions and so that meant the Discworld was in danger. That was my interpretation but yet again it, it just it's really a fault on my end but I got really confused there but um, and I didn't get to that last bit because I didn't read the whole book on this reread so um, that was just something that I remember not liking as much but um, if you've read the book maybe understand all that stuff a bit better um, feel free to leave that down in the comments so that you know we can kind of solidify what was going on there. I mean, Pratchett, when he gets into like the occult stuff, can be a bit ambiguous, and when you're tired, that can be quite confusing. But um, yeah, that's all I have to say that's a negative, really. This is a really solid book, and I believe when I reviewed this last time, I gave it four stars, or at least prepared my review for it last time. This time, I'm going to give it five stars, just because I've got a bit more appreciation for the beginning, which I didn't like last time. Um, this is a really, really great book, and... Um, I'm excited to see, well, to carry on reading the Discworld early books because this is when they start to get really good, as people say. I mean, they're all really good, but and people argue quite a lot about where the Discworld go books get really good. But this this is like a an improvement, so I'm pretty certain it, it, there's nowhere to go but up, really. Um, and I'm yeah. Next is Mort, which is really good. I've read Mort before, and Mort is a really good book, so I'm excited to reread that get into the death series, talk about all that jazz, and more importantly, I'm speeding quite fast towards Guards Guards, which is the first Guards book, and uh, a lot of people love the City Watch books, and I haven't read a single one yet, so I feel like I'm encroaching on enlightenment, so I'm really excited to carry on reading the Discord series and talking about them with you. Now before I go, I just want to say that I'm going to kind of pull the brakes a little bit on these Discord reviews, because um, I've been doing like one I've been doing them quite fast, like I read the Light Fantastic in a matter of four days, which is fast for me, and that meant that I couldn't read any other books. Um, at the moment I'm like three quarters of the way through The Time of Contempt, and I know that I said that I'd finish more before then, and I will finish more before that book, but I just want to read The Time of Contempt a bit more frequently so I remember the stuff, because in The Witcher especially, it's not the sort of book you can put down and pick up again, because there's all this political stuff going on, so I'm going to keep that ticking over, as well as putting more in the priority, so I can't promise that I'll get more out by next Sunday, although 
I will probably get it out definitely by the Wednesday after that. Now, that does mean that I'll have time to do a review of All Quiet on the Western Front, which is a film that I said I'd review to one of my commenters in my Witcher video. So that's what, that's what you can expect in the future. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Have a good one. Bye.